Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. So welcome to church. The Lord always does what is needed. Some of us need to recognize that the things that we're facing do not rule our lives. Do you feel at this moment in time that there is something that is ruling your life other than God? When we understand what Jesus has said to us and what he does for us and how he walks with us and equips us, if we look at Philippians 3, and I'm reading to you from Philippians 3 verse 12, This is a scripture that has been so important in my life. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. I want you to ponder that for a moment. Christ Jesus possessed you. He has bought you with a price, and that price is the price of his blood. When we start looking at what Jesus has in store for us, do we hold on to it, or do we look at our circumstances over and over and over again? If I focus on my circumstances, I am not grabbing hold of the fact that Jesus laid hold of a victory for me. He has taken that and he has laid hold of that for me personally. Many of us feel like that we we don't have victory in our lives. Over the last couple of weeks, I I shared with you last week, over the last couple of weeks, some of the things that we have been facing has been really crazy. Out of nowhere, things went wrong. Out of nowhere. Does this sound familiar? Everything is lined up, everything is there, everything is olek. Everything is where it should be, and boom. Whatever we thought would happen changes. Are we focused on our circumstances? Are we focused on what is going on in front of us, or do we lift our eyes up to him? Do we focus on who he is, or do we keep looking at where we are? Be strong and courageous. I tell you what, there's times that I don't feel strong and I don't feel courageous. One of the things that you face in your life is sucking the courage out of you. Look at it. Label it. Recognize that thing that is sucking the strength and courage out of you and recognize that Jesus has already defeated that at the cross for you. Everything that I face, every challenge that is in front of me has already been defeated, but I have to embrace it. I have to lay hold of it. I have to choose to fight. I have to fight the good fight. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12 says, fight the good fight for the true faith. Are we fighting by faith? Are we stepping by faith? It's like, this is in front of me, and I don't know what to do, but I'm going to step and embrace the fact that I have the victory over that. If I am stuck, 
And I see it in the counseling room. There are many people that land up stuck with their lives. They're stuck in a over and over and over the same thing. We're stuck. But God is calling us. Thank you so much. You are so Oleg. Isn't that wonderful? You can just... Okay, I need something. Cool, thank you so much. When we land up stuck in a situation, all we do is we focus on the thing and we land up doing the same behavior, the same thing. But when we listen to what he's saying, when we read it in the Amplified, it says, fight the good fight of faith in the conflict with evil. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession of faith. You have all said, I am a child of God. Sure, that was a moment here. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, am I in the right place? Are you a child of God? Have you said, Jesus, take control of my life? It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that lives in me. When I have made that good confession of faith, in the presence of many witnesses, then I have to understand the picture I had when I was busy with this is the Israelites... And now it's you and me, and if we make it personal, the Israelites are standing on their promised land. And God has said to them, that is your promised land. I have given it to you. All you have to do is go and fight. And we look at this and we say, you know what? I prefer Egypt. I prefer being a slave to the sin that I was involved with. I prefer this. That just looks like too much of a hassle. I have to step by faith. No, you know what? I don't know whether I can really do this thing. You know, I have to give up my past. I have to give up the things so that I can embrace the victory that God has already given me. Alcoholic, divorced, meet the Lord. Now what? What do you do? I'm not good enough. I'm stupid because I'm dyslexic. God gives us the victory. We can either fo focus on the labels that the devil, that the world wants you to focus on. Think of labels that have been put on you over the years. Think of what people have said you are. I'm a masterpiece created by God for good. Hallelujah. You see, when we start reading the word, we start understanding the word, then I can recognize the fight that I'm busy with here is not about here. My eyes are on the fact that I'm going to heaven. My life, that's my life. This is but a moment in time. And I'm busy with this battle for this moment in time. And then I'm with Jesus forever. But now I've got to deal with a bit of stuff. And some of that stuff I've got to deal with is me. It's not about everybody else. I've had incidences with different people where you're counseling them and they tell them, they tell you the story, this is, and this person, 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 blah, 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 and all the things that happened with all of these people, and I'm the victim of all of this. But it's funny when you look at it, what is the common factor in the breakdown of all the relationships? Me. So maybe I need to take ownership of the way I behave. Maybe I've got to take ownership of the fact that I'm being a bit of a fossil. 
Because when we take ownership of who I am at that moment in time, when we own it, then God can work in your life. If we don't own it, there's no change. Transformation happens when you say, I can't. As long as you say, I can. And as long as you say, well, you know what? I don't really want to associate with those people because, you know, I'm a bit better than them. I don't want to be with those people because they don't just, you know, they don't work for me. The Bible tells us don't consider yourself better than anybody else. Because we have come to follow in the footsteps of Jesus as children of God. We are there to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And Jesus said, I have come to serve, not to serve, not to be served. And there's a lot of us that don't like that saying. We don't like what that in... I don't want to be that. I want to be this. Because from the time I've been a child, I know what success is. You see, I've been told what success is. And because now I know what success is, I am measuring my life against what The world has given me as a measuring stick. But the measuring stick that the world is giving us is not the measuring stick that is in the Bible. You see, God doesn't judge your person. God judges your heart. My people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So when we start looking at this and we start understanding um, I'm there at my promised land, I must also recognize, and I shared this with you last week, Psalm, uh, Psalm 18 verse 39 talks about God empowering me, strengthening me for battle. He's girded me up for battle. The battle is not gone. God has strengthened me for that battle. The battle of being the father that the word tells us we must be. Not the father that the world says, the father that the word says. Guys, that's a battle. You know, sometimes we want to take the hand of correction to the seat of learning. But then we want to also take it to the consciousness to make it unconscious. And all of those things are the personal things. That's my flesh that I have to fight against on a daily basis so that I can be the father that I must be. So I can be the husband that I must be. That I can take my rightful place as the head of the home. Not because somebody spoke about it, but because it is God-ordained. It is God-ordained that I'm the head of the home. It doesn't matter how my wife behaves. It doesn't matter what my wife does. It doesn't matter what job my wife is in. It doesn't matter where she is in life. I am the ordained head of my home. Men, why are we not taking that position that we should be taking? Why have we become wusses in the world because we're concerned about everything else, but we're not standing as men of God? God's going to ask me about my wife. He's going to say, I gave you a gift. What did you do with that gift? You see, Renette given to me means that Renette will become the person that she should be because God has ordained me and I'm doing what I must do and then Renette becomes the woman of God that she should be. And because of what she does, I'm known at the gates. Amen? But it starts with what I do into my wife's life into my family's life, into, I haven't got a clue what I must do. I have no idea. Thank you, Jesus, that your word shows us what we must do. 
I've shared this with, with you before. We had no references, nothing. And when God called us, and we, we, we knew we were called, but we were still fighting. And then when we would fight, we would take the Bible, and we would be fighting about a topic. And then we would put that Bible on the table. What does the Bible say? There was so much peace and tranquility and fruit of the Spirit at that moment in time. The fruit hadn't become fruit yet. We were still a tree. No, we weren't a tree. We were a weed. We had to be changed. There had to be transformation. Think of the things in our lives that we make excuses for. And I really want to say this. The reason I've given you this introduction, this sort of message that I'm giving you, because Jesus says to us in Matthew 28, and we shared this with you last week, Matthew 28, verse 18. We know this scripture so well. It says Jesus came and told his disciples, I am a disciple of Jesus. Are you? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Hallelujah. So this is written directly for me. It's not written for somebody else. It may have been written years ago. But this is directly to me. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Teach. Who's this to? Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always. Go and teach. But I'm with you. You're not on your own. You're not facing the opposition by yourself. And when you don't know what to do, step by faith. Just take that step by faith. I don't know. I shared this with you last week. God directs our steps. The Bible shows us clearly that he will direct our Steps. If I'm not stepping, how am I directed? I have to step so God can direct my steps. And God will show me where I need to go. And last week we said it is time for us to embrace this. We also recognized that last week we were, sh- we were uh, focusing and celebrating Pentecost. And Pentecost is understanding what God has done for us. In Luke 24, verse 48 and 49, he says, You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. We go to Acts 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we have got this. Go and make disciples. And guess what? I am empowering you with the Holy Spirit to go and make disciples. I've heard people say, you know, this is not something I can do. I can't go and make disciples. This is not, you know, I'm not prepared to go to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. I'm not. That's not what God is saying to us. You see, some of us are in Judea and some of us are in Samaria and some of us are in the ends of the earth. So there where you are at, there where you are, in some area, Where you are, that's where you're a witness. That's where you are a disciple who teaches people. 
And it starts with our own families. It starts with your own family. And sometimes our own family says, what? Who are you to tell me? Well, it's heaven or hell. The choice is yours. It's simple. And and I'm not telling you it's what the Word of God says. If you choose to live a worldly life, you will go to hell. If you choose Jesus, you will go to heaven. Because Jesus paid the price for you. There's no in-between. Remember, I used that example. You know what? I'm I'm a little bit pregnant. You're either in or you're out. You're either right or you're wrong. But you need to understand that he purchased you to be right. It's your choice to embrace it. It's my choice to live as Christ bought my life. He redeemed me so I can live a life as a child of God. I must embrace that, or I can choose to carry on on my own. I can choose to walk out of here and just keep on walking and never see Renette again and never take my responsibility. That's a choice I can make. It's a choice you can make. Is it the right choice? Is it a godly choice? Or is it a selfish choice? Because I'm now just had enough of everything. You know what? I, I, just, I just can't do this anymore. Yeah, you're right. You can't do it. Most of us can't do life anymore. We can't do it. I am not able. God is able. So if he is able and I'm not able, why not embrace him? The Sunday school, we're talking about the names of God. And Johnny stands up and he says, I know what God's name is. His name is Abel. Because God is Abel. Another kid says, no, 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 no. His name is Harold. Harold be thy name. Thank you, Lord. God's word shows us clearly what our function is in the body of Christ. You see, so often we turn around and we say the pastor must do this and the pastor must do that. And the pastor, the pastor's paid to do those things. Ephesians 4 verse 11. From 11 to 16, it says this. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Hallelujah. Christ has given a special gift to the church, and those gifts are to the church for a reason. He gave the the gift to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Now, in today's world, everybody is an apostle, and everybody is a prophet, and everybody is an evangelist, and everybody. When we talk about these gifts, these are ordained, anointed gifts that God gives an individual to stand up and be that person. Why? To equip the church. So there are people sitting here that are being gifted into what we call the fivefold ministry. You have been empowered and gifted to be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. Someone here has got one of those giftings. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. I have been, I have operated in the office of an apostle. I have planted church. I have fixed churches. With no one around us, Renette and I went in and we did that. But that's not what I am. At a moment in time, God needed me to fulfill that role, and I did. 
God has given me words of wisdom and prophetic words for people. I have prayed for them and I have been able to share a prophetic word for them. The evangelist. This is about the furthest part in my personal gifting. An evangelist. An evangelist is someone that goes into a church and makes so much maracas that the pastor spends the next three years trying to fix what he did. But a true evangelist is you. You see, a true evangelist is not about standing in front of a crowd of people and shouting. A true evangelist is about worrying about who's going to hell. You see, a true evangelist has a burden in their heart for the person out there walking in the street that's going to hell. And an evangelist will go and share Jesus with them. Now, for many years, I really battled with that. And then I was introduced into a methodology called the way of the master. I've shared it with you in the past. And this is something that I have been able to share with people. We get on an airplane. I've gone to Cape Town, done some work in Cape Town, coming back. And you have an opportunity sitting next to somebody and to chat to them and say, to, do you consider yourself to be a good person? It becomes a conversation with someone. And even if they don't believe in being a Christian, the yardstick you're asking them to measure th themselves with is the Word of God. You're not asking them if they believe it. You're asking them if they measured themselves against that. Would they land up in heaven or hell? And it's amazing how many people will tell you, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. But if you were judged by it, where would you be? No, I'd be in hell. You want to go to hell? No, not, no, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't believe in that stuff. Then the Holy Spirit does the work. Because the Holy Spirit has come to convict, convict the world of their sin. You see, all we have to do is open the door. And we do have people. We have people, we call him Duomini, Piet. You guys know Piet? Piet's an evangelist through and through. He's an amazing guy. The way he can walk into a prison, walk anywhere, he can do it. You thought you were sitting there peacefully. You are now hearing that you can help do. And by the time he's finished with you, you are, you've made a commitment. You see, God gives us gifts like that in the church. But my gift, where I sit, is teacher. And even though in our church we call the position I'm in pastor, I am a teacher. And sometimes we do the other things and we ask God to gift us. And the Holy Spirit empowers you in that role. So the things that we spoke about last week leading into this, I am here to equip you. And there's some of you that should be equippers as well. Say amen. Remember when you say amen, eh? Liars go to hell. When you say amen, you're believing this. The responsibility, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do the work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will mature, say ouch, that we will mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of God. Then, verse 14, then we will no longer be immature like children. I'm not saying you're immature like children. I'm asking you to check yourself. Do you see yourself as an immature child? Or are you moving on? We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Verse 15, instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, 
who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part, say I'm a part, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. I'm responsible for you. Look at the person next to you. I'm responsible for you. When I do what God wants me to do, you grow. Hallelujah. And when you do what you're supposed to do, I grow. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So the whole body is healthy. We're not immature. We are healthy and growing and full of love. You know how many times you, you, you meet somebody and they just, let me, let me rather say not in the church, in the workplace. <laughs> you meet that person, you know, that person. The only way you can love them is love them by faith. And maybe you can only love them by absence. When you see them walking down, it's like you, you just want to go any other way other than meet them in the corridor. But I am filled with the Spirit. I have the fruit of the Spirit in my life, and I can. <laughs> Peace, love, joy, long-suffering. It's time for us to witness whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in our family, whether it's wherever we are, it's time for us to be a witness for God. It's time. But not only are we called to be witnesses, we are called to be disciples. We are called to be disciples. That's what this is all about. A couple of weeks ago, we went through to the 10 campus, the 10 headquarters, 10 stands for Teach Every Nation. It's in Falwater. We went there and we spent some time. It's the second time that I've gone on one of these things. I've been involved with these guys. Dr. Bruce Wilkinson, um, Walk Through the Bible. I've been involved with Walk Through the Bible for the last 20, 25 years. In some shape or form, I've been involved with it. And this is a new a new thing that they're doing. It's a new project that they've jumped on. And the whole project is about how do we equip people and help people that feel that they can't do something? How do we help them be able to share with a group of people? How do we help people to get just a bunch of, who's your, your friends? Okay, let's get together and let's listen to somebody and let's hear what this is all about. I want to play a video for you guys just to see what Dr. Bruce Wilkinson, what God had placed on his heart. Let me tell you why we started Teach Every Nation. Some people, I think, just assume that since Christianity may be on the decline in their little part of the world, then Christ must be failing in his famous promise, you know? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Well, is Christ really having trouble building his church today? Take the continent of Africa for a minute with its 1.3 billion people. Let's compare two periods and see where the growth really is happening. Take the first 1,900 years and add all the people who came to Christ and all the churches that were started. Now just take the last 100 years compared to 1,900 years. Christianity has grown more than all those 1,900 years put together. I'm so tired of hearing that Christianity is on the decline. People don't know what they're talking about. In fact, many of the global leaders are projecting from what's taking place right now that millions of new churches will be planted in the next few years. It's going to double. 
But with this massive growth comes massive challenges. Over 95% of those new pastors, they've never been trained. They've never been to Bible college. That's why I believe with all my heart that God has raised up Teach Every Nation to come along those millions of existing and new pastors and congregations and to serve them with transformational teaching and training. We are pouring everything we can into partnering with pastors and churches literally around the world because it's time. It's time to get with the wind of the Spirit who's accelerating the greatest revival in the history of the church. Why? Because Christ always keeps his promises. If you only preach, you bring about conviction. But teaching brings about how to, the way to live life that is transformed. The idea is to take all this amazing Bible-based material to the world. Do you know what Christ did the most during his three-year ministry? He taught the people, and then he trained the leaders. More than healing, more than miracles, do you understand the highest priority of Jesus was to teach? Because he knew that's how people are transformed. That's how people are set free. It's by teaching. And I wonder if it's Jesus' highest priority, should it be yours? That's why Teach Every Nation has invested the last five years developing the Bible School on Wheels. And that's why it's growing beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Why? Because, because it's exactly what Christ wants done. The Bible School on Wheels, a proven year-long curriculum that will help pastors, leaders, Christians and business persons make teaching God's Word a priority. We say Bible School on Wheels because our desire is to be intentional, continuously moving forward, never pulling back as we go into all the world. The 10 courses of the Bible School on Wheels year number one are biblically sound intellectually challenging, spiritually life-changing, culturally relevant, and personally transforming. We are trying to equip people for everyday good works, Monday to Friday. The public school teacher, the entrepreneur, the leader, the parent. Our content isn't just to inspire or inform. Our content is developed to transform. The 10 courses are spirit-filled. They change me a lot. They helped me, equipped me, transformed me, and helped me to, to, to groom and grow my leadership. I'm a better person. Inside the Bible School on Wheels box are the five core course DVD sets, along with access to the five web-based elective courses. The core courses each come with amazing full-color workbooks full of charts, graphs, outlines, and pictures all combined into one new manageable place we call the Superbook. This impressive hardback book not only contains the core course workbooks, but also contains additional chapters of practical how-to information for any student to successfully complete the Bible School on Wheels Year Number 1 curriculum and earn the beautiful 10 Certificate of Achievement it expanded our ministry greatly, and so we are able to reach more church leaders and pastors who have the potential to transform the nation. The fundamental work of Teach Every Nation happens at our training centers, and at the heart of the 10 training center is the 10 Dean, whose sole job is to teach as many students as possible. 10 Deans lead the students, coordinate courses, superbooks, and annual schedules, but their ultimate goal is to make disciples. I find that 10 is very useful and very strategic in training up leaders who can reproduce leaders. So it is a multiplication process. 
Our goal using the Bible School on Wheels is to have 10,000 training centers located in all 200 plus nations of the world. The Bible commands each of us to be both a learner and a teacher, to have input and to have output for you and then for others. That's why Christ's great commission is to go and to teach, to make disciples who are the learners of your teaching. Not just pastors, but Jesus calls every single follower to be a teacher of others. If you only receive but don't give, you will stop growing. Why? Because you're only following 50% of Christ's major command. Somehow, We've gotten confused that the pastor or the preacher <laughs> is the one who teaches and I don't have to because he didn't know it's the exact opposite. Maybe you're uncertain what to do. Maybe you're even fearful. That's where the Bible School on Wheels courses are the answer for what you've been waiting for and now wishing for. What can you do? You can just borrow from your dean the DVD of your favorite course and host your own courses in your home or a friend's home or a community center or a school or a business or even a government building. What we're doing at Teach Every Nation is we're looking all over the world for people that in their hearts they are deeply desirous of doing more for God, of expanding their own ministry. And we call these people 10 missionaries. What they're supposed to do is in a year to take at least four courses out into the community or to reach a hundred people. And our dream for this global movement is that in the very near future, we'll have a massive movement of over 10,000 10 missionaries reaching out into their communities. Just think about that, teaching others to become disciples of Jesus Christ. You see, the Word of God is powerful. And the Spirit of God is calling people all over the world to rise up and go fulfill their destiny of not only learning on an ongoing basis, but teaching. Could you be one of the people we're looking for? This generation's mighty men and mighty women of God Amen. Did it tickle you just a little bit? Now, last week, a lot of you said that you were interested in it. If you're interested in it, you must come and talk to us about what you are interested in and how. You don't have to stand up and teach curriculum. We have everything for you. You just put it in a computer and you play it. You can play it through your uh, TV if you want to. And then it gives you an opportunity on how you work through it. And this is the Bible, uh, the book, that, the super book that he was talking about. And every course, those courses that he was talking about there, is in this book. And it tells you how, what, where, when, everything that you need in order to facilitate a group of people coming together and learning a course. Last year, I did 70 times 7 with you when we spoke about forgiveness. I did it in the church. We ran it in the evening, and then I preached on it in the church itself. I am asking you to come and tell me that you want to do this. I'm not making anybody do anything, but I'm asking you, isn't it time that we start standing up and doing what we should be doing? You are responsible, and you are accountable as an individual. You are accountable because your part in the church is your part. And God's going to ask you about your part in the church. And when we start doing it, 
The biggest obstacle to doing any of this, the biggest obstacle is me. You are your biggest obstacle. And you've just got to work out that this is not about you having to study and do. No, it's about you facilitating. I want you to hear this again in Philippians 1 verse 3. I shared it with you last week. It's a scripture that I've been sharing with on an ongoing basis. Over the last couple of years, I've been sharing the scripture with you. Every time I think of you, that's Paul speaking, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Okay, you know. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to the Lord. And I, whenever I pray and make requests for you, I do it with joy. Why? Because you have been my partners. Ouch. In spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Guys, it really is time. I'm not just saying this, and I'm not trying to sweep you up with emotions, any of this. God gave us a command, and it's time for you to step into the command that God gave you. And you have no idea what the next step is. Here is ammunition that you can use in order to fulfill what God has called us to do. And we've got access to 20 courses here. We've got access to 20 courses. One of the most amazing courses out of this is to s- surveying the Old Testament. And it's a wonderful course to do. It shows us everything about how the Bible fits together in the Old Testament. It's a wonderful course to do. It's, and, and it makes it so easy to understand how everything fits together. When we start recognizing that I don't have to worry about being a master teacher because I have the master teacher who is teaching and I facilitate us. And it can be three of you that get together. Renette took her family, uh, the sisters and mom. It was four of them. They went away for a weekend and they they did 70 times 7 about forgiveness in the family. And it changed the relationship between daughters and mom. These are the kind of things we do. They didn't do the course themselves. They watched the videos, followed the questions, answered them, and did that work. It directs us. It shows us. So I'm challenging you today. It's time. I said that to you last week, and I said to you last week, I'm going to show you the things we've got hold of, whatever you need, in order to do what you need to do. Even these books, the courses that are here, we have access to print each individual course off a PDF. So if you are doing an individual course, this is your book, you're doing an individual course, we print the notes for you. And you give them to the people for that 70 times 7. We print the notes for 70 times 7 and you do it. If a person wants a book like this, that we can make that arrangement. But we do have access because it's been given to us. We are allowed to do this. And it's about taking this into all our homes and sharing with as many people as we can. And it's amazing that they've done this in such a way. Most people will tell you, copyright, copyright, copyright. You know what their copyright is? Share it with as many people as you can. How amazing is that? Praise the Lord. 
God is amazing. When I see this, I start recognizing why God always wants us to check ourselves. Where is your heart? Today we're coming to the, the communion table. And so often we make the communion table about everything else but what it is. I want, to, I want us to focus a little bit on the communion table in a different way today. The communion table is not about a church. It's not about a denomination. The communion table is about you and God. Jeez, you guys are amazing. I'm, 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 but everybody's watching Femi with that thing. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. It's the same as when you've got a baby, a, a mom brings a baby, and they come and they sit in the front of the church. You can forget about it. Just close the church. It's done. Because everybody's on that baby. <laughs> okay, let's get back to this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The table of the Lord is really about your relationship with God. It's not about you fixing yourself to come to the table. Say, you, you, you need to understand this. You can't fix yourself. Okay, you can't. It's impossible. So coming to the table of the Lord is not about you getting yourself ready for the table. The table of the Lord is here do this in remembrance. We come to the table of the Lord in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. He went to the cross. And because he did that for us, when I come to the table, I'm remembering the work that he did. You know what? I am not good enough to disciple people. It's not about you being good enough. It's about Jesus working through you. That's it. It's about you being available. Do you really think I'm good enough to stand in front of you? My goodness, I've been through stuff. I don't qualify to be here in any shape or form. But Christ called me with all my nonsense, and he changed my life. And as long as I hold on to him, when I, when I come to the table of the Lord, I look at this in such a different way because I'm celebrating Jesus calling me out of darkness. I'm celebrating the fact that my stuff is dealt with. Jesus redeemed me. He purchased me. He bought me out of where I was on my way to hell. He paid the price in full. Whether you receive it or not, he paid the price in full. We've got to receive it. And today we, we are celebrating that. So, so when I come to the table, it's not a morbid thing. I, I'm, I'm not like, the table of the Lord, oh Lord. I'm celebrating the fact that I never had to go through that. He did that for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That on the night you were betrayed, you took the bread and you broke the bread. Our lives are broken. There's not one of us here that can say our lives are whole. Our lives are broken. He broke the bread. And he did this for you and for me. What does it re represent? It represents his life going to the cross. He was beaten. He was abused. He was hit until his ribs were exposed. He did that. He was broken so that you and I do not have to live broken. Life will do everything it can to make you believe you must live in brokenness. But I don't. I celebrate this because of the cross. 
I come to the table of the Lord and I celebrate the fact that Jesus took the brokenness. He took my brokenness on himself so I can now live whole and complete. My life is complete in Christ. Without him it's not, but in Christ. And then he took the cup. And he passed the cup around to his friends. The disciples that were at the table that would go out into all the world. His friends. After three years he said to them, I don't call you servants anymore. Now I call you friends. He shared this cup with his friends and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The new covenant is the new agreement, the new promise that was written in his blood. So his blood poured out, represented the covenant first of all. And secondly, I am washed in the blood of Jesus. As far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west. My sin has been removed from me. It's such an amazing comment that when you talk about the east and the west, you talk about an, the world. Okay, the, This is not the world, but it could be the world if you use your imagination. So if I travel north, there will come a time that I will travel south. So north and south meet. My sin is so far removed from me that no matter how I travel, it never meets west. And if I'm traveling west, I will continue to travel west for eternity. They never meet. He paid the price so your sin is removed from you. I am free and I'm free indeed. When I come to the table of the Lord, oh, thank you, Jesus. I don't qualify to come to the table. There's nothing I can do that, that qualifies me to be here. The thing that qualifies me to be here is the cross. The completed work of the cross. Thank you, Jesus. What I want you to do as you receive it, as we receive the emblems, I want you to just hold on to it for a moment. And we're going to take it together. I will pray with us. We'll partake in this together today. Luke 22 verse 19 says, Hallelujah. It says, He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then He broke it in pieces and gave it to His disciples saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, He took another cup of wine and said, This, is the, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice. The place that we have this misunderstanding. So often people read Matthew 5 verse 23 in conjunction to, to communion. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar, or a gift at the altar in the temple, you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice, leave your gift there at the altar and go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So we take that scripture and we say, I can't have communion because I have to go and make right with somebody. That's not what that scripture is about. That's not about communion. You see, that scripture is about you bringing something as a sacrifice to God. You're bringing something, you bring in a gift. So you want to give, but you're full of nonsense with somebody else. 
Go and fix with somebody else before you give and be. So if I had to put it in plain, so you want to be a leader in the church? So you come in and you're saying, I'm making myself available to be a leader, but you've got issues with people. How do you lead if you've got issues? Go and make right and go and make peace. That's got nothing to do with the table. This is not about you. You're not bringing anything to the table. This is about Jesus and what Jesus did for us. What he did for me. So as we take hold of the bread, whatever there is in your life that you have been told, you're not good enough, the devil reminds you of sin, whatever it is, it leaves you broken in your thinking or whatever. We're bringing it to the cross today. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we are not able. We cannot do this without you. But you play, paid the complete price for my brokenness. That I can be whole again. That I can be complete as a child of God in Christ. I do not have to be focused on the garbage of my past, on the brokenness of what I've caused and what I've done because I am forgiven. My life is no longer a life of brokenness. As I take of this this morning, I leave my brokenness behind and I say thank you Jesus for what you did for me at the cross. In Jesus' name, take and eat. As we take of the cup, the new covenant, God has called us by name. I am his and he is mine. My sin is dealt with. He paid the price completely. So my sin doesn't have to keep me stuck. I am overcoming my sin every day. Because Jesus has overcome it on my behalf. Sin no longer has dominion over my life. I am free and free indeed. I am washed and covered and protected by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that my sin is dealt with. Take and drink in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in and through our lives. Father, we thank you that we are busy with going into all the world and making disciples. As we go our separate ways, thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that you protect us, that you keep us, that your face will shine upon us. Thank you, Lord, that your peace is with us wherever we go. Peace that transcends all understanding, guards our hearts and our minds as we are witnesses for you. Thank you, Jesus, that by your Spirit we are empowered for life. And thank you, Father, that we do this all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said, Amen.